American Secession by F. H. Buckley The Looming Threat of a National Breakup Chapter 3 Secession A How to Guide So let's get to it. It's a little bit complex, so I'll try just to hit the highlights to avoid making this into a half an hour uh, synopsis of the chapter. Most people today are living with a federal government that the founders did not ever envision. They didn't envision a distant ruler in Washington telling them how to run their education departments or local highways getting money with strings attached to federal ideas. That was not something that the framers thought about. They thought about a federal republic and they would not recognize the federal government that exists today. So with a very large growing federal government, secession is really about reversing that course to make it the opposite of what we're seeing. One of the things that we are reminded of in this chapter again is that secession is many of the movements in the United States are coming from the left as a way of creating a state with sort of woke progressivism. Could be California, could be the second Vermont Republic, but there's an idea that, hey, we have an idea, we want to live a certain way, and we don't want people telling us what to do, particularly when that federal government is an acting in an antithetical way to how we want. We are reminded of something after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Velvet Divorce, where the Soviet Union broke up into individual countries, and of course, some of the satellite countries of the Soviet Union broke up as well. Czechoslovakia was through the Velvet Divorce, uh, created two countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, without a bullet being fired, the Velvet Divorce. So secessionist movements in history come through a number of different channels. As I mentioned, the end of the Cold War actually created 24 new countries. Why? Because the fear of attack was gone. Maybe it comes through decolonization. Empires shrink and new countries are created. Even the idea of free state today, free trade today is much easier for smaller states to participate. There's lower costs, they can participate, and they can still have affiliation with the larger entities like the United States. But the bottom line for secession or the interest in secession that we have today is that to many, whether they're on the left or whether they're on the right, politicians and the policies that come out of Washington, D.C. are perceived as distant, burdensome, and not in alignment with their value system. We see this in small movements like the Tea Party movement, which started in 2010, and where I think we're going to start to see it a lot more. A lot of discussion given in this chapter related to the intricacies of a constitutional convention, where that's found. Article 5 of the Constitution talks a little bit about that process. There was some discussion given to James Buchanan, who was president, of course, from 1857 and 1861, and it was noted that he gave a flowery State of the Union address to Congress on December 3rd in 1860, and two weeks later, South Carolina decided to leave the Union. Why? Because whatever he was saying in that State of the Union was not connecting to the stakeholders of the country, and so they decided to leave. And four short months later, we were embroiled in a civil war. Lincoln received less than 40% of the vote, and proclaimed absolutely no intention to change slavery in the slave states. Yet, Southerners did not like him. Buchanan did not believe states had the right or reason to secede. And yet, 750,000 Americans later, there was a huge conflict which went, sought to settle that question. So, the war for secession was met by force, and very much in opposition to the principles that the founders had agreed to when the union was created. And there's quite a considerable amount of discussion in this chapter related to that. I'll mention a couple here just as a point of highlighting them. The Virginia Plan, Article 6, grants the federal government the right to disallow unconstitutional state laws. In other words, to bring the force of union against a state failing to fulfill their duties. Hmm, okay. Retracted in 1787 in our constitutional convention. The debate is, would marching an army into South Carolina without the consent of its people be considered an invasion? Many considered it just that. And so 
the Civil War was fought. Lincoln decided that it was more important to have union, and so he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He had Maryland politicians in a border state of Maryland arrested. He detained 13,000 civilians that he thought were agitators and had scores of newspapers shut down. So we have Lincoln judged today by his success, but had things gone differently, he would have been judged very differently. As was mentioned in the first chapter of this part of the book, slavery is the lens, the prism in which we see civil war and secession. And with the benefit of hindsight, we now have moral authority over the civil war. That isn't really an issue today. Slavery is not something that is on the ballot. So the 21st century and the things that we're dealing with in 21st century America are very different. In fact, you can almost imagine the U-Haul rental fees being paid for by certain members of the society wanting to get certain people out of their state or to have them come to their state if they were more in alignment with them. He noted that there are really two ways to amend the Constitution. One, by a constitutional amendment process in which three-quarters of the states, in this case 38 states, get together and, and add an amendment to the Constitution. Or a constitutional convention where legislators of 34 states get together and make changes. But we have now a Constitution that failed to recognize the early debates that the founders had related to a state's right to leave. These were specifically discussed in many, many of the Federalist Papers, the Constitu Constitutional Conventions, Convention, and of course the ratifying conventions when the, when the Constitution was making the rounds to be, to be settled. What we have today is that secession as a political matter was settled in Appomattox Courthouse in 1865. That's a political thing. We have a constitutional matter settled by Supreme Court in 1869 in Texas versus White, where the Supreme Court said states don't have the right to secede at odds with how the framers sought to create and perpetuate the Union. The Articles of Confederation was seen as a compact, a league of friendship. Yes, it does mention the word perpetual union, but like anything that is perpetual, any contract that's perpetual, that doesn't imply that it can't be ended. When two people get married, they marry for life, but that can be rescinded if one or both people decide that it's not working out. That happens every day in courthouses in the United States and everywhere around the world. Buckley talks about how much of the conversation, the debate related to the Articles of Confederation and, and later the Constitution, were oriented towards uniting to protect the individual states against foreign powers. Madison often referred to as the father of the Constitution, thought the Union could break up into a partial confederation at any time. And Hamilton, a tremendous advocate of centralized power in Federalist Number 6, said no one believed that perpetual union would prevent a breakup. And yet, Madison, in the Constitutional Convention, in the Federalist 43, and in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, said withdrawal is possible. So we know we have lots and lots of cases of the founding fathers saying, we can leave. And in fact, in 1798, Virginia specifically reserved the right to secede when federal powers became perverted. And this didn't just exist in the South. In New England, New England Federalists objected to, who were objecting to the War of 1812 had flirted with secession when they gathered in Hartford in 1814. This is a concept that has been well established. But yet, it was written by the victor. The victor in this case was Grant and his generals. Grant assured Lee that he would not be tried for treason after the Civil War. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, had a very, very different experience. He went to jail for a couple of years. And in fact, he wanted to go to court to prove that secession was constitutional. President Andrew Johnson had a very different idea and gave him amnesty. One of the reasons that one could imagine that was done was if he, Jefferson, had actually won and proven that secession was not only legal, in the case of the Confederacy of the South had been warranted, well, that could potentially start the war over again, or 
could at least show that 750 people lost their lives in vain. F.H. Buckley is a Canadian, and he mentioned something called the Middle Way, where in Canada, there is not the, what is the equivalent of the Supreme Court in Canada. There is no need to actually have a case with standing to hear an issue before their court. And so the big issue in Canada that has come up every now and again is the independence of Quebec. Uh, both in 1980 and in 1995, there were referendums related to whether or not Quebec could or should secede. And in fact, the country of France announced that if Quebec were to secede, they would recognize Quebec as an independent nation the next day. Some have wondered if the United Nations could get involved with helping a group of people secede from a larger, larger power, more powerful country. And the pretty much universal agreement is that if a country was under the thumb of somebody, some despotic regime, they were oppressed and that they were 100% united that they wanted to get out, well, then they could, the United Nations could, could step in. But that it doesn't really apply in the case of Quebec or even some of the secessionist movements that are happening in the United States. The big issue in a peaceful secession is how to handle national debt obligations. They need to be factored in to leaving. Assets and liabilities, like any divorce, need to be settled. And it is worthy of note that the American colonies, when they rebelled against, when they seceded against their the crown of England, when they won the war, they were in fact debt free. They were an independent state with no debt. But any peaceful secession today would have to include some kind of negotiated settlement. Now, there is a tension between unilateral secession, where one entity just says, we're leaving, and the larger federal government says no. And then, of course, there is this seeming bar on secession, as is exemplified in the case of Tex Texas versus White. And we have to understand that that we have to have some kind of balance between preserving some kind of a union and actually recognizing that people have a democratic right and a desire to live as a free and independent people. And so Buckley's notion in this at the end of this chapter is to perhaps advocate for this middle way where independence can be conceded, that that can be either voted on or that a Supreme Court could see it in a different way than it did when secession was colored in a, such a bad way by something as evil as slavery. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but could recognize there's cultural differences here, there's political differences here, and that these group of, this group of people has decided they want to be independent. And they might even perhaps maintain an association. There's nothing to say that an association can't be maintained after a country gains independence. So perhaps there's a middle way to settling this question. In any case, Buckley makes it a point to say that the barriers the legal barriers, the political barriers even, are becoming lower and lower, less and less, and that the temptation, for the same reasons, are becoming higher and higher. And that's it. That's the end of this part of the book. We're going to continue, of course, next week with part two, which is a cure for bigness. I look forward to continuing that conversation with you then. Please, if you'd be so kind to like and share this presentation with others, it certainly helps. And most importantly, if you could leave some comments, I would love to hear from you. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are about this idea, what you think about the book so far. Are you finding any disagreements? Are you finding any sources of agreement? And more importantly, how do you think you could make some of these concepts come to life? I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time.